Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. Hey. Oh, I'm yeah, I'm sorry about missing last week. I was on the road from a vacation. Oh yeah, I heard you had a surgery too. Yeah, on my okay. eyes. Yeah. Uh, our eye, left eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Left eye, yeah. <laughs> oh. It's well. okay. It's it's fine now. Yeah. Okay. Well that's good. <laughs> yeah. Trying to make sure you're all right. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It wasn't it had, I don't know. <laughs> So you have to get back in the swing of things for fall semester in yes. the PhD program, yeah. Yeah, I think the problem was it got tired reading, so I, I couldn't read. So I just sort of have given up on doing anything for a couple more weeks, and then maybe I could start back into, well, I have over 100 papers I have to read. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> so my eye gets tired. It's just like, ah, just leave it alone for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's good that you pulled through. <laughs> You're ready to yeah. go for, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I have, I guess we have GSOC updates again. Uh I guess, Hare Krishna, do you want to give us an update? Yeah, hello. So, last week I mentioned that uh, I found a way to like um, map an image onto an ellipsoid by giving uh, uh, texture coordinates to the image, uh, to all the 3D coordinates of the ellipsoid. But uh, I needed a a slightly different way because uh, I don't need to map everything that's on the image, so like, only a specific part of the image. So I was trying uh, using UE wrap wrapping now. So I recreated it using uh, I recreated the the thing which I wanted using Blender. Now I'm trying it to do in Python to the uh, the same way. So yeah, I'm working on that now, and also parallelly I'm working a bit on the application too. Okay. Yeah. And good. also, recently I faced a problem with 3JS. Like, I wasn't able to uh, load the textures of the model. I was only able to load the model, so I'm working on that. I don't know. What's the problem? Right. Yeah, uh, yeah so that's good. And do you anticipate any major stumbling blocks to overcome in the next week? or? Um, I'll be finding a way to UV wrap the thing which I've done in Blender, the same way I'll do, the same thing I'll do in Python. So that's a major thing which I'll be doing next week. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Uh, hello, Karan. Hi, Bradley. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi, Eric. Hi, Hi. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm doing okay. Uh, uh, meeting last night. Uh, you know, I was uh, traveling, so I got delayed last time. Yeah. So regarding the uh, updates, you know, I'm still struggling with the projection part uh, so far. The thing is, you know, with those eight images, all the image stitching algorithms that are there, they're mostly for, you know, panoramic images. You know, images. Yeah. Yeah. That shot through that one camera. So I'm still. Uh, you know getting better at the projection part so that thing is there uh otherwise uh the, yeah so this is the uh, according to the you know uh, this last week i was supposed to you know finalize the projection part so this thing is kind of getting more delayed uh, so i'll continue with it this week as well and this week's work would be you know adding additional features in in the form of you know more uh more labels or like we had uh, you know decided upon a list me and Hari Krishna about the extra features you know that we could add to the model itself uh, zooming uh, interacting with the model and you know labeling different parts of the model so we'll be working on that as well but the majority of the attention will still go into the projection part all right so, 
That's good. How, far, how difficult do you think this will be? you think this will be like a major stumbling block or something you can overcome this week? Or... Uh, the thing is, just, you know, uh, stitching the way uh, Hari Krishna is doing it or the way I had done it, uh, you know, when I'd shown my prototype. Uh, that way, stitching stitching is, like, we can, you know, just go with, with that algorithm if nothing else works, but the existing algorithms that are there. We, eight, nine images, uh, you know, according to a particular pattern. Yeah. So, then if you're using those two algorithms for, you know, uh, stitching all those images together, for these fair, uh, yeah. so I'll still keep on working with anything that's required right now is you know tweaking the algorithm to suit this particular ellipsoid model. Okay. So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll keep on working on that. All right. That's good. Uh, Ron, uh, I was discussing this with uh, Fred Bookstein a bit. Uh, he works on. Uh, Okay. Oh, I don't know if you know the old pictures from uh, Darcy Thompson. Uh, the, uh, well over a hundred years ago. Uh, at any rate, okay. uh, yeah, I think Bradley is Bradley familiar with them. Yeah. You've got a suggestion, uh, and that is to use since since we're confining ourselves to a sphere. How about decomposing the images before their overlap into spherical harmonics? And might that help? Now, I don't know what spherical harmonics like on a patch over the surface rather than the whole surface, but uh, they, be, they might be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like mathematically, you know, we have uh, hyperbolic geometry, and like there's a negative inversion and a positive inversion. So if you're taking like an image of a sphere, I think it's it's like you're taking an image of a negative inversion kind of a spare thing, you know, like when we have lenses, you know, a fisheye lens. So the way a concave lens would, you know, warp the image and the way a convex lens would, you know, warp the image, that negative or positive inversion. So it's, yeah, I think some, something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, the way that inversion transformation takes place. So yeah, it's clear you can take, if you take one image and project it onto a sphere, you could then do harmon uh, spherical harmonics of that one image. Uh, yeah. The question that, is, if you, have, sounds, yeah. if you have overlapping images, can you make use of the spherical harmonics? I have no idea. Uh, overlapping, yeah. Overlapping, the thing with overlapping is that can be, you know, uh, that can be easily, if we pitching algorithms kind of deal with overlaps pretty well, but they don't deal with these inversions very well, you know, like, uh, so it's like, if, yeah. if you're taking a picture of a plane, it's easy. If you're taking a picture of something like that is more concave or convex, it kind of, you know, starts giving wacky results. Okay, let, like that. Yeah, let me make a suggestion. For instance, if you projected one image onto a sphere, okay. and decomposed it into spherical harmonics, okay. and then you project another image that overlaps with it onto a sphere and get its spherical harmonics, you could approximate okay. overlap by saying, I'm going to make an image whose spherical harmonics are the average of the two uh, spherical harmonic amplitudes for each uh, so-called frequency or whatever you want to use or sequence. Okay. okay, now that might be rough, but it might be, it might converge after iteration. Yeah, okay. So with more images, with more iterations, you know, we could maybe... Well, more, yeah, more images or uh, somehow introducing uh, iteration into just two images. Okay. Okay, okay. so it, the, the point is that if you have two overlapping images, their spherical components, the, the amplitudes of spherical harmonics should be similar in some sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so if you do it, you see, if you, if you got an average of their spherical harmonics, 
you would then create a new image, which would be a montage. Okay? It might not be accurate. It might require iteration to get it yeah. accurate. Okay. Uh, what, what do you mean to decompose? Yeah, uh, okay. okay. Uh, can, I, can I just ask, like, what do you mean to decompose uh, an image to spherical harmonics? Do you mean like the functions? Yeah. Because there are functions and to see the coefficients. Uh, yeah, if, well, it's not the image, it's the sphere, spherical representation which is decomposed. So you take the two-dimensional two image, you project it onto the sphere, and then you get your spherical harmonics. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, later, because I'm kind of like uh, hey, is this information. Alan, is this problem obvious to you, or you <laughs> no? I think I think I'm, I, I'm missing some uh, some background on, on the problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the background you're missing is that yeah. cameras take two-dimensional pictures. And we're taking a pic. We're taking pictures of a spherical embryo from many different s spherical angles. Okay. Okay. And yeah. so to get the, we're then projecting them onto a virtual sphere in the computer. So we know. Uh, I see. Okay. And then you could do spherical harmonics. What, what do you mean do spherical harmonics? Are like, you, well, are you, you're, are you familiar with spherical harmonics? Mm, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with decomposing an image to like uh, frequencies. If, uh, right, right. These are the these are the corresponding uh, uh, series decomposition of a spherical function with a constant radius. They're spherical, now, yeah, they're analogous. To, yeah, they're analogous to sine and cosine waves. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, but so they're on the surface that. of the sphere. I see. And they produce a, a spherical harmonics produce uh, what do you call it a uh, a, a set of components Positions. which span the full, whole space. In other words, you can represent yes. any spherical surface by an infinite expansion of the spherical uh, the spherical uh, harmonics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in a, in other words, they're a basis function for this for functions on a sphere. Yes, I understand. Like if you if you take this basis and you represent the image after you project it in a sphere with that basis, and then you suggest what to take the average of each coefficient. Yeah, I'm taking yes as an approximation. <clears throat> okay, now there might be a way to iterate so that the average is replaced by more better refinements later. But at least the average would represent both images, which are at slightly different angles, because they're overlapping. Yeah. Okay. Bradley, what do you think of this approach? Well, yeah, I think it would be nice to try, see if it would work. Uh, yeah, I okay. think that Morgan just said that they do that in EEG modeling, too. So you have uh, spherical, oh. in this case, the head, and you're trying to find locations within it. You're trying to approximate, like, basically tangents on a sphere. So this would be, I okay. guess, a very similar thing where you'd have, like, images that were sort of tiling a sphere, and then you're finding, like, a, a you're trying to cross-reference locations, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I think it would be nice to try, especially if we get around some of these challenges with uh, um, some of the other things with the algorithm. I know that what it... What Karan's talking about, a lot of the algorithms assume like a panoramic view. Like they'll have these 360 videos where, you know, you yeah. have it all Let from the same stupid, source. Yeah. Stupid question. Are any of the panoramic software uh, based on sine and cosine coefficients? Uh, when you match, will they match in real space or in the space of the uh, amplitudes of the sine and cosine co coefficients? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, the algorithm does use uh, these things, but not in that general sense. It's like uh, it, it's more about you know feature tracking and then stitching based on that feature instead of you know. Uh, oh, okay. okay. The, yeah. In other yeah. words, in other words, we, it, perhaps the way to go about this was is first to try to 
see if one could do standard montaging uh, of a scene uh, using uh, sine and cosine waves. And then generalize that to spherical harmonics if it works. <laughs> In other words, it might yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it looks like, yeah. It, yeah, it might be the thing is, the way of, uh, of montaging. Yeah. Uh, Bradley, do you know uh, Fred Bookstein? I don't. You, do you know his work? Uh, I've heard of his name. I don't know much about the work. Oh, okay. Though. He works on tra transformations of shapes. Okay. Okay, like the Darcy Thompson. You know, you know the old pictures of the fish transformation? Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what inspired it originally. Oh, he's he's retired now. Uh, I tried to entice him to uh, come to our group and give us a lecture. Yeah. Uh, if uh, uh, it would probably help if you uh, uh, seconded that. All right. Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I have three email addresses, two of which work I think, <laughs> uh, <Yeah>. for him. <laughs> I think you let his uh, mailbox overflow on one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I know that um, uh, uh, at Fimmer and they actually used some of his work for some cortical shape modeling. For shape modeling? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, is, what is cortical shape modeling? Oh, right. Uh, uh, well, sub, subcortical shape modeling. So, so fitting fitting shapes to the various subcortical structures from from MRI data. Uh, oh, okay. They, so you're, talk, they, you're talking about brain brain yeah. cortex. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Cort Sorry. Cort cortical is a rather general word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this is that that's um, uh, a software package called First that's in FSL. Uh, and um, Brian Brian Patno uh, did that together with uh, Mark Jacobson. But I, oh, I know yeah. that they they used some of the, or, you know, they were inspired by his work. You know. Are they assuming a spherical brain? <laughs> no, no, no. The uh, EEG people EEG people assume a spherical brain. You know, which oh. yes is is as much like a spherical cow as you can imagine. Uh, uh, what's uh, what's an EEG? Uh, uh, Electroencephalography. Uh, oh my God. It's when you're, you're uh, if you see my, uh, I guess my, my image isn't, uh, uh, when you you got the head covered in electrodes. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, the electrodes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So going back to the 80s, there was the the, the models, the, the electrical dipole models assumed a spherical a spherical head. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, own, like, a, uh, I own a spherical. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. It's ceramic. I showed you. It's not handy. I have to dig for it. Well, because you don't, uh, you don't have, you know, you can't sample the neck, right? So you don't have the sphere properly Please. sampled, and Please. so there's there's yeah. a polar average reference effect correction that uh, is a paper from back in the '90s. Uh, uh, Marcus Younghofer uh, uh, did this, and, uh, and and so you're you're basically assuming, yeah, you're assuming a sphere, and you're extrapolating on the sphere oh, okay. to this, these other locations. And, yeah. right, so there's a lot of spherical harmonic stuff in EG. Hmm. Okay, so so this approach might work. Yeah, yeah. Fred Bookstein's the one who suggested. <laughs> Okay, and I can see the possibility of it working because of the average. At least you can do an average. Right. Okay. okay. I mean, let's put it this way: if you have two views but they're identical, then there's for how the average of their spherical harmonics should work. Right. <laughs> so the question is, how bad is the deviation as the angle between them increases? Yeah. And does it, does yeah, that require some court, some sort of correction? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, from here, I've looked into more implementations, you know, uh, because translating this theoretical concept into code, you know, would kind of take more time. But I'll, I'll look, I'll either have to create one from scratch or maybe okay. there's something like just to uh, So there, we got two papers going. One for just standard montaging with sine and cosine uh, expansion instead of feature analysis. <laughs> and then trying to do it with the embryo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Karan, for that update. That was uh, hopefully worked some issues out for you. Um, and then thank you, Hare Krishna, for your update as well. Uh, we have some things in the chat here. I think this is just Morgan saying hello from Paso Robles, which is in California. Then talking about spherical harmonics and EEG um, and some other things here. That's the, the Marcus Young Hopper paper. Right? Okay. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, Morgan's on the road and Jesse is here. So, hello. Uh, did either of you have any updates you wanted to share with us or just comments? I know that Morgan's already spoken, so. Oh, for those of you who are new to this, uh, I'm bouncing up and down because I'm on a treadmill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. I've got a treadmill with a desk that holds the computer. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jesse said he won't be able to say much until later, but thank you for that. Okay. Um, uh, how are you? Let me ask quick, Hari Krishna, do you have any thoughts on the uh, spherical harmonics approach? No. Uh, what? I didn't hear exactly. Do you, do you have any comments on the spherical harmonics approach? Mm, no. The, the overlap problem. Are you familiar with them? No, no, no I'm not familiar with them. Oh, that. okay. Yeah, this, this usually you don't get it till advanced calculus courses. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're going to stretch your brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, go read up on spherical harmonics. Yeah, I will do that. They're similar to Fourier expansion in sine and cosine waves, but they apply to a sphere. Uh, so I know that. Fourier expansion. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, Alan, you we were talking in the Slack um, earlier this week, uh, so well, have you, I, I sent you some materials after a meeting last week. So, how did you find those materials? Do you have any questions or? Yes. Uh, no, not that I have uh, some questions. What I did uh, after the meeting, I found a video of uh, of the bar. Bacillaria? So, how you, I yeah, don't remember how Basilaria. you say that. Yeah, Basilaria. Basilaria. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just uh, after like some, maybe like uh, checking about it with uh, with Dick, um, I uh, I wanted to kind of clip uh, just a, a short, like maybe like a 10 or 30 seconds of it. It's got to be just static because some of them just like the, the point of view just moves around. Yeah. So I downloaded like a movie from YouTube, just uh, one of them, and I uh, I just clipped it to like the what I need. Uh, I wrote the code, and then after that, you send me the link to the uh, Vastelaria repo that there is some Devo uh, Devo no, no, Devo Warm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna add that afterwards. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the thing. I, like. Uh, that far so much. I kind of also didn't uh, didn't sit on it so much. I did also wanted to check some some issues in the DevLearn repo, and then we kind of discussed it. Uh, me and uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Sushman, I think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yes, he's not here. I think. <laughs> Yeah, he's not here, and also Anand, uh, and I think, and eventually Anand kind of like uh, fixed it. 
but there was something about like me just updates and everything. I did. I still didn't um, install like the repos on my kind of like, machine, so I can't like I can't like check everything like, properly. So I also kind of plan to do that as well. Right. Um, yeah, and I think I think after that I was having like some thoughts about like how the main question about like proving the Bastilleria that they have like uh, just a smooth action. So what I would want to do is just to to track them and then just portray like their kind of movements frame to frame and basically see if it kind of like just like jitters on a motion uh, with kind of like with center of mass or center of something that can, can just like right. a measurement they can find uh, with it. Alan, one comment about that. The first observation of the jerky movement of single diatoms mm -hmm. uh, was done in 1979 at 10 frames per second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. since most of your data is probably 30 frames per second, yes, that it might is, be yeah. adequate. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So just, I think, I think, what do you think? I think just for myself, like just to see like frame to frame, track them and just like point like, oh, this is the center yeah. of mass at every point. See that it's kind of follows like a one line. That's, I think that's going to be enough. Yeah. The, the weird thing we got for single diatoms is we, we went, we had a camera that went up to 890 frames per second. Hmm. And okay. the motion was still jerky. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, was it, I, 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 I can't. So in the that's thirty that's frames, that's second, on single, yeah, that's on single diatoms. Uh, sorry. So what is a single diatom? Is a single oh, cell? Oh, well, a single cell that moves independently by itself and does not form colonies. Okay. Uh, I see. Okay. Yes. So the question is just on the same. My question that I'm searching for is just a, a single diatom within like within the, the colony to check that its movement is not jerky. Right. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, cool. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. obviously that's if, you, if you can get the answer for one cell, you, you want to answer it for at least three cells. <laughs> I think like once I'm going to do the algorithm, it's going to be like for, I, I'm trying to, uh, I think in my head, I'm gonna try and do something automatic, and then I just can do it for all of them at once. Yeah, and then I only try. The reason we have to do this carefully is that uh, smooth motion of diatoms may be an optical illusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And therefore, we can't trust our eyes. <laughs> yes. We okay. really need a very careful analysis. And is is like an analysis of the center of mass kind of like moving or like a geometry that should, that should do the only problem you uh you might have is if a diatom if the view of a diatom changes then it, it's two-dimensional image may not be the same yes it wouldn't. okay yeah so you you want basically what you want is colonies or a portion of a colony that is completely in focus which means if the focal plane of a microscope is typically very small. Mm -hmm. So if it's all yeah. in focus during the time that you are analyzing, it's probably okay in terms of shape because mm -hmm. the, the projection is probably the same. If it goes in and out of focus, then it may rotate to also relative to the axis of the microscope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think it's going to be more, uh, um, I don't know if it's going to be a tracking question, maybe more, because the most tracking models, they kind of assume a smooth motion to begin with, or they have, like, they have their own right. filters assume uh, smooth motions. Uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm familiar with common filter that's kind of like for tracking, and that assumes like smooth motion anyway. <laughs> So uh, I think it's going to be more of like a, just a detection problem, frame to frame, and that's kind of like and then just connect okay. those together. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, kind of like uh, yeah. In writing it up, make that distinction because I was not familiar with 
the assumption of smooth motion in tracking. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll uh, just uh, write it down. Yes. Uh, but anyway, yes. It's. Uh, I think that's where I came to. Uh, uh, this oh, week. If, if you read our paper on jerky motion, it's a long one. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll see that one of the things we used is the shape of the diatom in order to get sub-pixel resolution. Mm. Okay, because the diatom is, a sh is rigid, it was possible to do that. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. And we got so we have an assumption that uh, like each cell, it doesn't it doesn't change like the formation. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't change, change unless it's dividing. Yeah, yeah. And well, which can... probably not happening within like thirty seconds, or like you can be able to visually see it. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Division rates are the fastest division rates are about three times a day. Yes. Um. Yes, uh, Morgan, you wrote about YOLO v7. Yes, got it. I think I think every like yeah detection yeah network can just yeah gonna be able to use it. Hope they have some uh, yeah uh, pre-trained networks and diatoms or a <laughs> city. But I think not. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I know that like um, you know like PG is you know they, there's the more kind of typical microscopy stuff, but. Uh, but this sounds uh -huh. like a pretty, pretty typical object recognition. Yes. Yeah, I mean, also, I'm kind of, I think, or oh, could be that more uh, kind of simple algorithms like optical flow. Once you kind of mark th the thing itself manually, it's just gonna, yeah, kind of go through it. This would be optical flow for a vehicle over a rough landscape. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you, Alon, for the update. Uh, if you need anything, let us know. Uh, we have, yes. you know, the institutional knowledge because we've been doing this for a couple of years. So, uh, you know, we can if you see something that maybe doesn't make sense or something, let us know. Yeah. Cool. Yes, I'm not sure. Yeah. So, <clears throat> a long, long week. Uh, I was going to give, I, I wanted to kind of get an update of the, okay. Um, yeah, where's your suntan from Florida? Me? Oh, I don't know. I don't see any suntan from Florida. <laughs> it was, it was kind of raining a lot there. That was awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got caught in the rain one day, but <clears throat> yeah, it's. Yeah, it is winter. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess we have the GNN's project, uh, Long Hui is involved in that. I don't know if he can put anything in the chat about what, where they are in that process. I know we got some updates, uh, last week, uh, from, I think from Wataru and they're progressing. They're, they, uh, Wataru, I think is getting through stage one and they have the stage one, stage two and stage three. Yeah. And so stage one, I think is getting... To coming to completion, um, stage two is something that uh, Jia Hong is working on independently. I think he's making good progress on that. And then stage three, I, I guess they're starting to work on now. So um, hopefully, you know, we'll get some, I'll, I'll elicit some updates as well uh, for the week. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep on top of that. I just want to make a reminder that if you're doing GSOC projects, that they're due on the 7th of September. So that's coming up sooner than you think. That's about three weeks. So it's, uh, you know, this is a time when you kind of want to get everything sort of, uh, you know, start to think about like generating documentation and, you know, working on fe adding features to the interface or whatever you want to do to bring it to a completion point. So you don't need to like, you know, you can deviate from what you proposed in the final uh, thing, but you do need to have something that you can submit that can be executed. So that, whether that's like a, a, a notebook, like a, a collab notebook, or if it's like a, a repository that they can just install. I mean, because they're going to check this and see if it runs or whatever. 
Um, so that's that's what they're looking for. But I mean, the the point being is that you know when it come to a completion on some of the work. Now you can you work on it afterwards. I just we want to come to some sort of stopping point for the submission. And so I mean, you know, if it's like something that they're longer term things that we want to do, that's fine. Uh, we don't have to implement them in this next few weeks. But we do want to get to a point where we can submit something um, and then just, you know, continue on from there if necessary. And um, yeah, so I mean, you know, after we're after we're done, I think we're going to have some nice tools. We have the DevoLearn uh, repository where the DevoLearn program, which has been developed over the past few years. We're going to try to incorporate the GNN into this, uh, into DevoLearn. So we're going to have like a new module. Uh, then the spherical uh, representations, the uh, digital microspheres, we have two approaches here, rival approaches, Hare Krishna and Quran. And we'll try to stitch those together into one, not now, but we'll do that maybe later. But right now we'll have like, you know, two products that are sort of complementary. And then eventually we'll be able to put that together into something that people can use. Um, and, you know, the reason we're doing this kind of rival or this uh, approach is because, you know, uh, there might be one approach that's better for some types of embryos and the other approach might be better for other types of embryos. So it's nice to give people that option. And especially when you have the diversity of the biological world, we know, like, as we've talked about in our meetings, it's, it's quite vast. And one, you know, one set of techniques don't necessarily work for another model organism. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, in so in, in some of the other, in the other group I'm working with on GSOC projects, uh, we had mentioned that we were going to do like a presentation at some point in the future on their projects, like a summary of their projects. And at some point, not not necessarily before September 7th, I'd like to get our GSOC students and I'd like to, to give them, you know, give them a short, have a give a short presentation or kind of do a short review of their finished product so we can advertise it for next year. And if we, uh, you know, we did advertise it for various things. So um, that those are just things coming up. I want to keep people aware of. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, Paso Robles was on earlier. Yeah, yeah. We're Morgan, okay. is, I think. Yeah. Oh, it is Morgan. Oh, yeah. okay. Morgan. <laughs> How about giving us a list of references to spherical harmonics in the EEG? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Ha happy to. Um, <laughs> as as okay. well as uh, uh, their more their more recent uh, um, uh, more recent work is really just um, yeah. Our harmonic uh, harmonic analysis on on uh, connectomes <clears throat> is is kind of an extension of that. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, that that takes us up to 2022. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we need papers to extract the basics. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna share my screen. I want to go over some things that I uh kind of present for the week let's see if my screen shares okay it says it's sharing i think it is all right um so the first thing i wanted to mention was something that alan brought up in his update uh that there was some activity in the devo learn repository uh so i, I put this in the slack anant kumar wataru uh, Sushmanth uh, and uh, Awan were all on this uh, issue. And so um, then this is the issue here. It's number 69. So this is DevoLearn. This is the DevoLearn repository and the DevoLearn organization. This is the issue tracker. So we have a, a number of issues here. If you want to address some of these issues, you're free to do so. Um, you know, you just uh, put in a, you put in a, you basically say, I want to address this. You put in a comment. So there are a lot of different maintenance things here. There's long-term vision. There's some of these things that are just like unit tests uh, that aren't consistent. There are enhancements that we might want. 
Uh, you know, there are different things like that. So at this number 69, which is here, this is the bug. Colab demo requires multiple upgrades. And this is something that was going on with, uh, like, I guess it was a compatibility issue. So Mayuk, um, who's the maintainer here, put out some points here. Uh, this is a, a beginner-friendly issue that he proposed for people uh, because, you know, not he doesn't have time to do the actual work, and I don't, and, you know, so we want to get people involved. Um, and then Alon said he wanted to take a look at it. Um, he took a look, then Sushman, um got involved here, and he's basically going through. And then Mayuk said, uh, shows them where the Colab notebook is, and they took a look. Then Anant, uh, I think he resolved it at some uh, de to some degree. Uh, then Alan was discussing this with him. Uh, Anant then, so uh, yeah, they basically went through this. And uh, I, I don't know, Alan, did this get resolved or is there more to do here or what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Anand said something that it's uh, he managed to make it work, okay. but uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at it thoroughly after they said because uh, after a while I understood that they need to download both repos, the Devo Learn and the kind of like the other one that the notebook is at, so I can just connect them both. Yeah. Uh, so I still need to check the if it kind of works because Anand said that now it's kind of work for him. Uh, I proposed a workaround, but then like the workaround didn't uh, didn't kind of, like uh, fix all the issues. So that's like the embryo segmenter that needs to be updated, maybe. So I think it's not maybe not uh, fixed yet. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. So I mean, this is something we might consider making a, another issue on for uh, like if there's something that doesn't get resolved, you could make another issue for like uh, like put it in the documentation or uh, how it might be clarified or something. I mean, uh, just I'm just trying to suggest best practices here because it's always good to have like, you know, when people do contributions that there's like a uh, follow up on them. Otherwise it's kind of like it gets lost, but um, then that's good. And so there's this, uh, maybe there's a poll, there is an open poll request in DevoLearn and I don't know if it's related to this, but this it's changing instructions to install newest version of Evil Learn. So it looks like maybe Wataro yes. did this. And this is where okay. So then this is where you have this pull request. Okay, and then Mayuk made a comment on this. So this is still pending and I'll 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 talk to Mayuk or yeah, I'll talk to Mayuk about it to see if he has any suggestions before we move forward. But yeah, this is good. This is a good interaction between people. I just wanted to show everyone how our uh, GitHub issues work and how people working in open source can uh, make a contribution to the platform. So thank you for uh, contributing. And uh, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, this makes it easier. Uh, what uh, admins of that? This kind of like, is that you or? Uh, uh, well, Mayuk is the main. <clears throat> Mayuk is the maintainer. He's usually the one who approves the pull request because this is sort of the thing that he uh, originally put together. Like you know, he was able. He was the one who had sort of proposed this this version of DevoLearn, and then you know he's he's been able to work on maintaining it. And, you know, he has a pretty good technical sense of what needs to be done for it. So I leave it up to him as to, like, approving pull requests, yeah. But um, we, you know, we always need people if people want to take a part of it on. And, you know, it's like, you know, when you build the software, things go out of date. Things don't always, you know, we always have issues with people trying to use it. <laughs> and so that that's why it's important to have these sort of, issues and follow-ups and things like that yeah well thank you yeah that was great <laughs> okay yes so uh that that's uh some nice open source activity um, i also found a paper on particle tracking and we talked about this with respect to the, some of the stuff going on in the gnn's project um this is a paper um plus one and it's brand new 
And it's this particle retracking algorithm capable of quantifying large local matrix deformation for traction force microscopy. So it's it's definitely related to sort of the uh, the motion tracking and the cell tracking that we do in uh, the project here in different ways. And so this is a nice new paper on this. Um, so this the abstract. I'll just go through the abstract and maybe some of the images. Uh, it just you'll need to read the whole paper if you want to get a really good technical appreciation for it. But. Um, the abstract reads, deformation measurement is a key process in traction force microscopy, which is TFM. And so I'm not familiar with traction force microscopy, but it's just a, tech, a specialized technique that people are using. Uh, conventionally, particle image velocimetry, uh, <laughs> PIV, I know what that is, or correlation-based particle tracking velocimetry, CPTV, have been used for such a purpose. Using simulated bead images, and I guess they show those in the paper, we show that these methods fail to capture large displacement vectors and that it is due to a poor cross-correlation. So when they're tracking something in the image, you know, they're, they're trying to build this displacement vector. And they're showing these methods fail in, in some ways, uh, especially for large displacement vectors. Here, to redeem the potential large vectors, we propose a two-step deformation tracking algorithm that combines CPTV, which is this method in particle tracking velocimetry, which performs better for small displacements than PIV methods, a newly designed retracking algorithm that exploits statistically confident vectors from the initial CPTV uh, to guide the selection of correlation peak, which are not necessarily a global maximum. So this new method named CPTV retracking or CPTVR was able to track more than 92% of large vectors, whereas conventional methods could track 43 to 77% of these. Correspondingly, traction force reconstructed from uh, CPTVR showed better recovery of large traction than the old methods. This, this method uh, applied on the experimental bead images has shown a better resolving power of the traction with different size cell matrix adhesions than the conventional methods. So this is just variations in the uh, in the uh, thing that you're imaging. Altogether, CPTVR method enhances enhances the accuracy of TFM, which is this traction force microscopy in the case of large deformations and present in soft substrates, which are like biological tissues. We share this advance in our TFM package software. So they kind of go through a traction force microscopy. It's a soft gel-based assay that reports the spatial distribution of the traction transmitted via cell adhesions of cell of a cell or cells. So cell adhesions are things where the cells attach to something, and there's this traction that's transmitted from that, and that's what's picking up or the spatial distributions of it. So I guess they can simulate this with beads in a gel. So you can do this with or without cells as an input. And it quantifies the gel deformation and reconstructs the traction field. So this is uh, measuring, like, uh, this is using uh, the deformation knowledge of this uh, gel's elastic modulus. So it's using physical parameters to, to uh, show these, these uh, tracks. So this is traction reconstruction. This is kind of one of these techniques that is, you know, it's it's useful, I think, in development because you're dealing with a lot of these type of phenomena. So, um, like with cell migration especially, you'd probably be able to use as well. Um, so, yeah, they're really the older methods, the adopted methods from experimental fluid mechanics, which have been well established and generated a sufficiently accurate displacement field for a small to intermediate deformation levels. But the large deformation levels they haven't been able to use because they're using these techniques that they've kind of brought in from another field. So I'm um, trying to find some images here. Um, let's see. Yeah. Let me see if we have any questions. I don't know if we have any questions in the chat, but uh, yeah, we have maybe a couple here. Just waiting for it to load. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, okay, it was just a couple things from Morgan. Um, okay, this is it. So here, here's some images now. Um, so these are the typical BIV methods, a topology-based tracking and the current CPTV failed to track a large local deformation. So this is where they're showing what PIV is doing. You see these tracks here. They have the displacement field and the displacement map. And so they're showing this sort of how this works in a regular uh, context. If you see cells in this uh, field of view, they're, they're moving around, they're leaving this track and they're, you know, you can visualize that. The thing is, is when they're on tracks, yeah. Is that a diatom in the picture? I don't think so. Uh, this is, what is this supposed to be? Um, the upper left-hand corner one. Yeah, I don't think it, it is. Like, I think it's just like a track that yeah, from, it, looks, it looks like a pennate diatom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know what they're actually imaging. It's just like general cells. They don't, uh, well, they're doing the synthetic bees. I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a probability uh, yeah, image yeah. of kind of like displacement, as you said. Yeah, attraction. yeah. so this, these are bead images here. This is ground truth, which I assume is some sort of cell tracking. This, these are bead images where these beads instead of cells, and they're just showing this displacement, and they're they're kind of getting a sense of, you know, what, what the, the sort of the parameters of the method. And then they have this displacement map, this displacement field that they're getting from these images. So they don't, yeah, they don't mention too much more about it in here. Um, then, you know, they give some examples of different methods um, and how they, you know, how they did that. Then they give some details of the CPTV algorithm uh, which traditional PTV identifies centers of individual particles from a pair of images and match the locations per frame by a suitable pairing algorithm. Uh, it has found, been found to make tracking more reliable and robust when a cross-correlation is used to prevent information as a predictor corrector. So they're using cross-correlations to sort of correct the, the paths and to predict them. But if you have, they have this problem on long-term or long uh, long distance tracks where this cor cross correlation breaks down. Uh, so this is they're using this uh, a CPTV identifies individual beads using a Gaussian mixture model, then applying a normalized cross correlation, and then the CPTV retracking algorithm actually um, improves upon this. Um, the algorithm assumes that the first time CPTV is performed with a high significance criterion and a strict filtering criterion, from which seed points consisting of failed tracking and filtered out locations are determined. Looping through these seed points, neighboring vectors with a certain search radius are gathered per location from which statistics such as the mean and standard deviation is calculated. Then cross-correlation score is calculated over a range of displacement magnitudes an angle from their medians, while the local maximum within the range of obtained from which the global maximum is first compared with the second maximum, local maximum, using the significance criterion. So they do a lot of like uh, comparisons and thresholding here and prediction. And so this is how they're making this CPTV retracking algorithm better for this. And so then they go through some more methods. I'm not sure if they get into any more images. Uh, let's see. So here are the results. Um, yeah, so they created a, let's see. Okay, it's not working. You might not be able to get into these images, but it's just, you know, this is a nice paper on this method. Um, I don't know, you know, we, I know we've talked about cell tracking in the group and we've had some, yeah, so Susan said, this, this tracking method might be useful in my research on mechanics. So I'll send the paper out uh, by email and Slack so people can read more about it. Do um, you have any questions about that or comments? No, uh, it looks, uh, looks interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, their method. All right, yeah.
it's not related to the, the tweet that you had, Bradley, about uh, uh, you know track, tracking it flows. I mean, it, this was like a fluid dynamics. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I think that was know. a different thing. That was a review on fluid dynamics. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, no, I understand that, yeah. but I mean, in the sense of like, is is that is that part of the problem that like, you know, that you have a, a non-sphere kind of moving with a lot of fluid action? Yeah, and, and so the the you know its dynamics are kind of hard to predict. Yeah, well, in this case, you're looking at uh, like an object tracking through like a medium, like it could be a gel or it could be like liquid. And it's kind of moving through, and it's like if a motor boat goes over a lake, and you get like like a wake, and you can track that. You can see it because the water kind of tracks it for you. But in these small things, right, but that, yeah. But I mean, there's 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 got to be, or are there a lot of flows in that medium too? Uh, I don't think they actually look at the flows. There probably there could be flows. Like the, yeah. I mean, is the is the object kind of buffeted by additional kind of currents as it's moving through this medium? Well, uh, <laughs> I think in like if you, I like in a like an under a cover slip, maybe not. But if you were looking at like a real image, real time image of like an embryo, even you might have small currents that you know. Uh, displacement currents and because the cells are so small they're you know really hard to detect but you know it's possible i guess there's got to be some displacement of the fluids in there yeah yeah uh, just, just just curious like what what are the you know what are the forces that you're you know trying to trying to capture you know is it the is it the um, the object itself like is it is it motile or is it uh, being buffeted by currents yeah but, but Perhaps it's more under fixation, you know, uh, for, for microscopy. Great. Uh, I've seen some, I, I think I went to a couple talks on like how they've looked at flagellar bacteria where they actually create a wake. I mean, they're very tiny forces, but they're like, because they're moving their tails around, they're creating this wake and they're like the dynamics, but they're so small that you can, it's hard to detect them. So. It's, yeah, you it's know, like, again, it's like my my only real experience is watching videos from Journey to the Microcosm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, yeah, I'd like to finish up today, and if you have to go, uh, that's fine. But I'm gonna share my screen again. Well, anyways, yeah, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about something if I can get the thing to work, but I'm not sure here. So this is, okay. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, we have the 3D printed embryos I wanted to show. Um, if I can get into it. So I think it was Morgan who sent this up. And he sent out some uh, papers on 3D printed embryos. Uh, or he sent like this paper, I think it was in our Slack, about this group that was like printing 3D embryos and they were uh, making like little models of of them from like they would take images and then print them out uh i don't know if this was dick or, or uh morgan but in any case this is uh Are you? yeah, yeah. this is uh yeah they use cmos and 3d printing for nmr spectroscopy at the single embryo scale yeah i, I was focused on the spectroscopy but yeah okay. it, it seems super super interesting yeah, yeah. So this is uh, using NMR. They're able to, you know, image things. Uh, they're able to get information about chemical composition of things, but they can also image things um, at the volume scale for microorganisms and single, single cells. This is hindered by the limited sensitivity of the detector and the difficulties in positioning such small samples in proximity of the detector. So, you know, this is stuff that we want to be able to image but it's hard to get good three-dimensional images so recently we introduced an in innovative generation of nmr probes based on the combination of single chip cmos integrated circuits uh, together with high resolution 3d 3d printed microfluidic structures so this is what they're doing they're like, imaging these 
embryos, and then they're using this uh, single chip C CMOS transceiver with co integrated microcoil uh, and assembly with a 3D printed micro channel. So they're able to like get images of this and they're able to print them out. And you know, they're using a 3D printer, so it's like a material that they of their choosing and they print it out. Is this, this like in some sort of plastic or is this like a do you know any more about this, Morgan? Oh, okay, yeah, he's trying to learn what the kids in engineering are doing these days. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a it's definitely a nice little paper. It looks like it's only one page. It's like a report, but they have like uh, uh, they kind of go through some of this. They don't really go through the steps in detail, but they basically have this embryo the image. Then they uh, print it out, and they're able to make a little model of it. I know we talked about uh, printing out embryos before, 3D printing embryos. I don't know if there's, I don't know, I think it was a conversation with Dick at one time about that. But I don't know too much more. Certainly I've been trying to, to look at more at how microfluidics is being used. You know, I, again, this kind of relates to... Um, some of the stem cell work and in particular kind of uh, yeah, being able to isolate or separate uh, stem cells on the basis of some, some function. Um, and, you know, again, it's like the, the kind of fabrication techniques that are available to, to engineers these days as, uh, you know, requires a whole new retraining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bradley? Yeah. I have an amusing con uh, uh, comment on this. Uh, the uh, you said they make small models of the embryos. Yeah. Uh, I did a calculation once where is if you took a if you took a diatom and you could image it at full resolution. Okay. Yeah. And then you tried to print it. It would be fifty meters in di diameter. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Because the resolution of the printer, if you re try to retain, in other words, the resolution of the diatom using the resolution of the printer, it would have to go to 50 meters. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. To get everything. That yeah, that gives you an idea of how fine the detail is in a diatom. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the resolution here is. I think it's I'm not really sure. Yeah. It's <laughs> But, yeah, yeah these, these 3D printers don't have that great resolution. I once tried to uh, make a, a three-dimensional globe with 3D printer, but two millimeters in diameter, and it was worthless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, there are some very fine resolution glass printing printers oh, that okay, are, are better. <laughs> Do the calculation for a diatom. Uh, okay, <laughs> See how big well, it have to be to not lose any resolution. Okay, I need the um, detail. Um, well, uh, it's, it's the kind of paper Gabar and I did uh, showing that in terms of silica and diatoms, uh, their structure at eight uh, orders of magnitude. It's eight orders of magnitude. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll see what I can find. <laughs> yeah. So th I think they also talk here about like how they do this. Like they basically get this reading. Uh, it's hard to see here, but uh, then they use that to sort of like as the detail. So it's not not like an exact replica, but they're getting like a spectrum of the body sections and eggs so they're looking at these heterogeneities as like a spectrum of some type and then they're just basically printing it out um yeah so it, i don't know it's yeah it's you, you don't get all the resolution but uh it's you know it's something <laughs> now we had talked as you know from nmr you know usually usually you've got a, a sample a lot of that sample uh, and so being able to try and try and capture the, the embryo it's it's 
take some remarkable work. But, oh yeah, yeah, but definitely. Really, in, you know, really important chemical information. Yeah. Now, we, uh, Dick and I did a paper, I think, with a few other people uh, on these images. Like uh, one of his students at one point had hand drawn. Uh, an imaginal an imaginal disc from Drosophila, which is like this uh, oh, yeah. structure that would become an eye. Uh, so, you know, it is like very a very uh, you know it's a very small thing, and the resolution was kind of we played tricks with the resolution because you had all these fine structures that were drawn out at a very large in a very large size, and so digitizing that then kind of cheated in a way <laughs> because you got higher resolution. Uh, without having to worry about like the the imaging power, and so that that was kind of an interesting exercise because um, you know we got this sort of resolution for free. Someone just drew, hand drew it, and there was a lot of work that was involved in that. But it was like at the end of the day, you yeah. had this. Yeah, it took my mother I think ten hours to correct the uh, uh, the hand drawing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so, so sorry. It, Using like the the hand drawing as as like a like a prior. For... Uh, yeah. Well, the problem is that the hand drawing included cells that were not completely enclosed, so the perimeter was not all there. So you had to you had to make a guess as to what the perimeter should have been. Okay. Yeah. That way we Excellent. got individual cells. But it, it actually did serve as sort of a prior, and that it <clears throat> helped us do the sort of analysis that we wanted to do which was looking sort of at the frequency of things across the surface. So you would have these things that were sort of defined at a decent scale. You could like tell kind of what, you know, we had a good prediction, I guess, human expert prediction about what they should look like. And then we could just, you know, measure it out without like obscuring it into very small scales. You'd have it kind of blown up. Yeah, that, that just, just makes me think about a, um, uh, Recent recent paper I saw from from MGH on um, uh, Anastasia uh, has a paper on like using high resolution, you know, fixed post mortem brain uh, data to to improve you know, imaging data that you collect from a from a person that's uh, you know that you don't get to scan for a day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, sounds sounds like a similar kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have anything else we want to talk about? Um, if not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Bradley. Do you remember recall how many cells were in the uh, Drosophila imaginal disc? Oh, uh, I think we were able to segment like eight thousand. So Eight that thousand. was all the things we could segment. So, you know, uh, there were different types of cells that they were characterized by, like, I think, the volume and other things. But, yeah, I think we got, yeah. like, 8,000 out of it. Hello. So I'm following up on a few things from today's meeting. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is On Growth and Form by Darcy Thompson. It's a great book, and we talked about it, I think, uh, a couple years ago in the meetings. Uh, the 100th anniversary of this book was in 2017. So it was a book that was written in 1917 by Darcy Wentworth Thompson. And he was a, a, I guess he was the developmental biologist, mathematician. He was kind of a polymath. And he uh, proposed that we can take animal phenotypes and we can warp them in different ways that the sort of the coordinate system will fit the phenotype of another organism and then we can look at that difference between those warpings um, using landmarks. And I'll show you some pictures of fishes where this is the case. He also worked out some really interesting math with respect to uh, nautilus shells and, and other kinds of seashells that are have a rotational morphogenesis. And so he worked out some things on that as well. So let me show you uh, some of the things that we have here. And then I'm going to talk about this, this paper on egg shapes. So let me go to the growth and form. So this is the book here on growth and form. This is, there was a revision, a revised version in 1942 that came out and it was a little bit thicker, um, but the, the original book, it's it still had the spirit of the original book. And this is a Nautilus shell, of course. And you can use things like the golden mean to characterize this the growth of this structure. Uh, if you've ever heard of phyllotaxis, that's another thing they characterized 
uh, with mathematical rules, with uh, number sequences, and so forth. So he was able to put some mathematical bones on the skeleton of developmental phenotypes. And it's really interesting work. People talk about it from time to time. A lot of times in the design community, in in like uh, design for like different things like architecture and other things. I don't mean like intelligent design. I mean, you know, uh, design design. And in uh, developmental biology, although developmental biology, its use has been a little bit uh, not not necessarily at the forefront of the field. Uh, in in artificial life as well, there were a couple papers, uh, several papers have been written from time to time on this topic. There's a book called On Growth Form in Computers, which is where people are looking at how to model uh, this sort of on growth and form thing using rules, using other things. So it's very attractive to an artificial life audience. Um, Peter Bentley is one person who um, is involved in that. Um, so, you know, you have digital artists and you have people interested in development. And so that's where that, that has lived on in that, those spaces. So this is an example of fish I told you about earlier. This is the fish where you take one phenotype and it's on a square grid and you take some landmarks of this fish and you define this grid by, not by the grid anymore, but by the landmarks. So there's an operculum, which is about here on the fish. There might be a, a, an intersection of lines. So that's a grid point. There's another grid point down here um, at the caudal, at the beginning of the caudal fin. There's another maybe a landmark here at the middle of the uh, dorsal fin and so forth. So you have these different landmarks on the fish. Then what you can do is you can take this square coordinate system and you can say, okay, I want to take this coordinate system, but I want to warp the coordinate system so that it fits this other fish that I found. So this is a different species of fish. It has the same landmarks, but they're in different proportions to the original fish. So you warp the grid, and then you measure that, that warping of the grid, and you evaluate it in some sort of, in, in maybe, you know, some sort of math. You can use some sort of math. You can use geometry. You can use topology, whatever you want. And so this, this works for a number of species of fish. Just, you know, all you need are the same landmarks on each, on each species. And you can go across species and characterize these. So this is a square grid. This is a warped grid to the, to the front. It's, it's elongated at the front and it's shrunken out the back. This one has some curvature. This one at the lower right, where you have some curvature around the, you know, where the snout is. And then you have this, uh, really tall fish. This is an angelfish. This is where the the uh, dorsal fin is way up high. The caudal fin is is shortened relative to the uh, operculum, and there's this. It basically characterizes geometric or, or phenotypic space in some sort of geometry. This is another example of grid fish. Uh, again, you can warp the grid in any way you want. This is a, a more rounded fish than this, so this is an elongated fish, and you can see that it warps the grid in different ways. Uh, and then this one here with another example of the fish where it's kind of a close-up of the last one where you have this rounded fish versus a, this elongated fish, and it gives you different coordinate, or, or the space between the coordinate points are different, and you can actually use a different projection system. So this is a, a different projection system from this. So this is a Euclidean space, and this is a different space. Okay, so that's uh, what I'm going to talk about with respect to growth and form. I think if you uh, read the book, you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's a very thick book. It's like 1,200 pages or something. And an interesting historical note about Darcy Thompson is that he wrote his book in 1917. And if you know here history, you know that Darwin wrote his book in 1859. And, um, uh, you know, we had people, we had the German embryologists who didn't really want to embrace evolution, uh, you know, uh, fully. So they, they were doing a lot of developmental biology in the absence of evolution. Eventually they came on board and that became part of developmental biology. You also had uh, Mendel who was working on his uh, heredity experiments with peas, and that was also in like the 1880s. So this is well before Darcy Thompson wrote this book. What's interesting about this book is he talks about phenotypes, 
but he doesn't really get into Darwin and he doesn't get into Mendel and he doesn't really get into any of this stuff that's going on around him. And I, I don't know why that is. Uh, the developmental, early developmental biologists were somewhat resistant to evolutionary theory and to heredity. Maybe it's because it's not something that's immediately applicable to what they're doing, although evolution certainly is. Um, but it's an interesting sign. If you read this book, you'll, you'll see what I mean. And I don't know if anyone's written anything that's sort of addressed that. And I'm sure there's some like philosophy of science <clears throat> that maybe addresses this a little bit more directly. But just the point, just if in case you want to read the book. Okay, then there's this new paper on egg shapes, and this is a really nice, uh, it's a, what it is, is it's a paper on looking at uh, the diversity of egg morphologies, and then there's even a data set that you can download. So um, this paper is by Seth Donahue, who actually has a, a decent presence on Twitter, he works at the University of Chicago, and um, I think he's still at the University of Chicago, and um, yeah. And so this is a, a paper on insect egg morphology, evolution, development, and ecology. So this is a, a paper on characterizing different types of insect eggs. But what they've done is they've made measurements and they've released a data set along with this paper. So the abstract reads, the insect egg can be viewed through many lenses. It is the single cell developmental stage, a resource investment in the next generation, an unusually large and complex cell type, and the protective vessel for embryonic development. I had a professor once described a seed, or which is the plant analog of a uh, egg, as a baby with a, in a box with its lunch, which means that it's a very small organism. It has some sort of nutrients inside, and it's in a box, a protective box. So that's pretty consistent. I, in this review, I described the morph morphological diversity of insect eggs and then identify recent advances in understanding the patterns of egg evolution, the cellular mechanisms underlying egg development, and the notable aspects of egg ecology. I also suggest areas for particularly promising future research on insect egg morphology. These topics touch upon diverse areas such as tissue morphogenesis, life history evolution, organismal scaling, cellular secretion, and oviposition ecology. Then very uh, integrative approach. Now, uh, we're on cellular secretion. I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, when I was doing some work on um, induced pluripotent cells and on stem cells, um, the head of the lab asked me if I could do some work on what they called the secretome, which is where cells get secrete a lot of uh, chemical compounds into their immediate environment. And he wanted to see if we could char characterize these as sequence data and other things and do some bioinformatics. And as it never really got off the ground, because as it turns out, this is not, they do have tools for this and they do have some data sets, but it's really a understudied area of biology. And I just, I find that interesting that I see some references to it recently, and I'm just interested in what people are thinking. It's a very interesting thing because we're dealing with a lot of signaling in development. And of course, that would be a very nice tool to have uh, if people really had a, a good set of tools for secretion uh, assays and, and secretomes. So um, so this kind of goes through a, a quote from uh, Jan Swammerdam, who's a cent 17th century naturalist about insect eggs. And uh, so he has this collection of insect eggs. He talks about them. He, he's kind of fascinated by them. Um, and he kind of describes where he's finding them. Um, so they're kind of, you know, doing, the, they have this box of eggs, basically, that they're offering us. And it's all these different types of eggs and data and measurements and other things. Um, so this shows like uh, phylogeny, which is an evolutionary tree of egg volume. So this is an ancestral reconstruction of egg volume. And so the egg volume is color coded here, the size. So the smaller eggs are dark and the lighter eggs are yellow. So you can see that you have all these different species and the phylogeny that defines their evolution. And then you have these color coded and you see that in Polynoptera, you have some generally larger eggs. Uh, Hymenoptera, you, which are ants, you have some smaller eggs and some larger eggs. Uh, Polynoptera crickets, I guess. 
Um, and then, you know, you have some variation across the different uh, uh, clades that you have here. So you have uh, Apterigota, which is, I don't know what that is, but that's a um, moderate sized egg. Anyways, you can see that egg size isn't necessarily like, uh, it's not really derived in any one clade. It's it's what they call um, poly, uh, poly uh, well, it's, it appears many times in the tree, so um, independently. And it's hard to say whether there's a common ancestor for any one egg size. Uh, a lot of this is ecological, so ecological pressures determine egg size. But sometimes, you know, you see some clades here or some subclades that have like, that are, um, have smaller eggs. And, and But of course, you have smaller eggs over here too. So uh, it's polyphyletic in the sense that it's not, uh, there isn't one origin point. I guess you could argue back here is an origin point, but then you have different sized eggs that are descendants of that as well. So it's polyphyletic, definitely. Um, like I said, though, it's, yeah. So he says that these, these clades defining these organisms are monophyletic. Some of the clades themselves are polyphyletic, but the actual egg sizes are not restricted to any one clade. So it's probably driven by a lot of ecological pressures. Um, so it kind of goes through developmental control of egg size, which is where egg size variation, uh, you, you can actually approach this in different species and see what is happening. In, in the, you know, if you can knock out certain developmental genes, you can actually look at developmental conditions and you can moderate the egg size in that way. So here they did a... Um, Let's see. They did an experiment with uh, Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly, in which researchers artificially selected independent lab populations for unusually small and large eggs. So they did some evolutionary uh, uh, experimental evolution here. A genetically mixed pool of flies was separated into multiple populations. One group of replicant populations was selected for large eggs, another for small eggs, and some were left as control populations. So they did this experiment for 1.5 years, and this was about 30 generations. The egg volumes had increased or decreased in the replicate populations by roughly 10%, but it is not yet known which cellular and developmental changes were responsible for altered egg sizes. So they haven't isolated it to genes or, or circuits or mechanisms, but they do know that if they do this sort of, uh, these rounds of selection over a fair number of generations that they can get this effect and this increase or decrease in size. Uh, egg shape, you know, this is something that you can measure. Um, they do some quantitation of egg shape here. They show how they're doing this with respect to the length of the egg. And they show this uh, angle of curvature versus asymmetry. There's a plot showing that. You have aspect ratio versus asymmetry, and you have aspect ratio versus angle of curvature again. So these are these three variables that you're switching off, and you're actually looking at how they fit together. And so these are the mathematical calculations here, along with width. Uh, and then, you know, it describes what an aspect ratio of an egg is. Uh, and so we can we can look at these patterns. Once we have them measured, we can characterize them. In a phylogeny, or we can characterize them in terms of their ecology, or we can do things like experimental evolution and then measure the outcome of those experiments. So there's a lot of elaboration on egg shape. Um, you can be running this word operculum, which is actually just a generic term for uh, some sort of feature on a phenotype. But yeah, so there. Uh, egg shape is defined by a number in a number of ways. They have different aspects of the egg, and you can look at them and use those as features. Um, and, you know, it, well, egg physiology is interesting because uh, eggs are actually this permeable boundary between the environment and the embryo. And so eggs really serve this purpose of this box. And so the exchange of gas and water across the eggshell at the proper rate is crucial for embryo development within the egg. An eggshell's morphology can include a complex internal structure and pores such as hydropiles and areopiles. Collectively, these determine the respiratory treats of an egg. So a hydropile is where water is exchanged, an aeropile is where air, uh, oxygen is exchanged. 
In some insects, there is a a period of embryogenesis during which the egg absorbs water from its environment, increasing the overall size. The movement of water across the eggshell can be further modified by the developing embryo itself, which secre when it secretes an additional inner layer to the eggshell called the serosal cuticle. So, they're, you know, in embryos, they're secreting things that are building the eggshell. They're secreting things out into that local environment. So they're not just secreting things that communicate with other cells, they're actually building uh, this this box on their own. And so this is um, this is interesting because actually there are things that uh, modify this ability to secrete an egg. And we know that like weak egg shells can result in um, vulnerabilities for the embryo. So it's recently been shown, for instance, that in several disease vector mosquitoes, the chemical composition of the serosal cuticle can have a dramatic effect on resistance to desiccation. So this is something that, you know, is can be introduced by um, uh, like disease vectors. It can be just something that's a defect in the uh, in individual embryo or it can be something else that is a genetic variation. And so that's, that's a nice, so this is the, the paper. I, uh, this is a nice paper to follow up on because it does have a data set. And this data set here is uh, on scientific data. So a data set of eggs uh, size and shapes from more than 6,700 insect species. And Cassandra Extravour, who's another uh, person we've profiled in these meetings, uh, is also on this paper. Uh, this is uh, kind of describing the data set. It just describes this th these thousands of eggs that have been characterized and measured. And so it goes through this. This is just kind of describing the data. So if you want to use the data, go to this paper in scientific data. Uh, go over the sort of the metadata that they give you here. And then you can download it. I think it's on Figshare, actually. And so this is the zip file. And then I put it into a... Uh, an Excel sheet, which is kind of hard to read. I just wanted to dump it in there to show how much data you have. So I think actually I have it in columns here. No, I don't. Okay, so these are just like, this is the ID and this is the names. So you have, you know, uh, you have all these references from the literature and the references are listed here. There's an ID and then you have uh, some information on the side. So you have a lot of different potential measurements that they've made on these eggs. Uh, so this is like a literature review. It's like going through the literature, finding these eggs, finding the information about measurement, and it's all put in one data set for people to use. Um, this is just kind of a dump of data, but you can like work on, work out the data, put it into whatever format you want. And, you know, it, you know there, there's a lot of missing data, but there's also a lot of useful data in here as well. So that's all I have to say about uh, those things, the, the on growth and form and the egg shape data set. I, I think those are two complementary things, by the way. So, you know, you could like model eggs from the data that they give and then, you know, do these transformations and see what kind of interesting things happen. Or you could just do it on some other phenotypic data set that yet to be named. Uh, but I wanted to go over that for people. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you for meeting today, and uh, we, we can continue the conversation offline, and uh, see you next week. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the help. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.